So this is your first lecture in Biology 175, Anatomy and Physiology. This is the one quarter series of Anatomy and Physiology. So it does stay fairly basic. It is not as detailed as the two quarter, two quarter series. So in your online classroom, there is copies of these notes that you're welcome to download. And what I would recommend doing is using the outline and filling it in as you go so you get that same experience of taking notes like you would in a classroom. For most people, the writing it down is very helpful in learning the material. There is also these exact copies of notes that will be available to you in your online classroom. So in this class, we look at anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is the study of structures and physiology is the study of functions. So fortunately, we are looking at them together in here. It makes it a little bit easier. Anatomy by itself can be a lot of memorization. And so in here, we're going to actually talk about the functions of the things that you're learning. It gives you a little bit more reason to be able to remember their names. So when we look at anything that's alive, we look at its level of organization. And so this starts at the chemical or molecular level. This is going to be where you have your different types of chemicals or elements. When you look at a periodic table, all of those letters in the little boxes are symbols for the different types of elements or the different types of matter that we have. So cells are made up of different chemicals and molecules. The cells are the smallest living unit. They will group together to form tissues. They're just going to be groups of cells that work together for a common purpose. Organs are going to be groups of tissues that work together, and they're going to form our organ systems where you have several groups or organs that work together for the same purpose. An example would be your digestive system. You would have the stomach, you would have the esophagus, the liver, the small and large intestine, all working together for the purpose of acquiring nutrients and getting building blocks into the body. The organism is all of these different systems working together in one life form. When we study the human body, what we do is break things down into the different systems. So they can be broken down into 11 to 14 systems, depending on what source you're using. It's not that one is right or wrong. There's just some of the systems that can be subdivided into smaller parts. The first system we look at is the integumentary system, which is your skin. This is going to form the protective barrier between you and the outside world. It will produce some excretions like sweat, and then it's also able to absorb some things. A lot of times that is a function of the skin that we don't immediately think of, but we can actually take advantage of that with transdermal patches for medications. Your skin is an important step in temperature regulation, as well as the first step in vitamin D production. Our skeletal system is going to help to form our structure and framework. It's going to give something to, for the muscles to attach to. It's going to provide protection to your more critical structures. So if you look, your brain is almost entirely encased in bone, and that's a pretty, pretty critical structure for you to have to stay alive. It's also going to be a place for mineral storage. The muscular system is going to be used for movement. It's going to pull on the skeleton to be able to do that. It's also going to generate heat. So when you look at what happens when you get cold, one of the things you'll do is shiver in order to generate some additional heat to try and warm yourself. The nervous system is used for communication and coordinating activities. This is going to be fast communication. If I were to walk by and step on your foot, you would get a very fast message letting you know that that was uncomfortable. The endocrine system is going to be used for communication and regulation in the body, but it's going to be more slower sustained messages. For example, when your body is going to go through a change like puberty, it's a slow, sustained process that's going to be controlled by the hormones of the endocrine system. So your cardiovascular system is important in transporting things. It's going to transport nutrients, oxygen, and waste throughout the body. The lymphatic system is also going to help with that process in transporting things, but it's also going to have protection through your immune system. Our respiratory system is going to be used for gas exchange. This will be how you get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. So it will also allow you to remove that carbon dioxide waste. 
The digestive system or gastrointestinal system is important for obtaining the building materials in our cells. This will also be how we acquire our energy and then where we get the nutrients for energy storage and to repair our cells. The urinary system has a big job in filtration. It's going to help to filter out the blood and then be used to excrete those waste products. The reproductive system is going to keep the species going by reproducing new life forms. So when we look at characteristics of things that are alive, there are some common features we see. Whether or not something is black and white or is alive is not always as black and white as it may seem. So one of the things it will do is it's going to have metabolism, which is chemical reactions occurring in cells. Even things that are not alive will have chemical reactions. We just refer to it as metabolism when it's in something living. There'll be responsiveness to change. Something changes in the environment or internal conditions. The living organism is going to attempt to respond to that. There'll be movement. This can be movement of the arms and legs or moving things within the body or even within the cells. Living things are going to grow. Generally, they don't start out as full size. They'll start out smaller and progress from there. There will also be differentiation and specialization of the cells. As the organism proceeds from being a single-celled organism onto being a multicellular organism, some of those cells are going to take on specialized roles. For example, you have liver cells, you have skin cells, you have kidney cells. Once they have these specialized roles, that's where they're committed to spending their life. You can't take liver cells and put them on your skin and expect them to function there. Living things will also go on to reproduce. So one of the things living things like to do is have homeostasis. It's the attempt to maintain a consistent environment. It's going to do this through feedback loops or feedback systems that are going to regulate what's going on in the system and then respond from there. It's going to do this through the use of receptors, a control center, and an effector. Your receptors are going to detect the change going on in the environment. The control center is going to process that information and decide how does the body need to respond. And then the effector is going to carry out the change that was determined by the control center. Most of the time that control center is going to be in your central nervous system. An example would be the, like the thermostat in your house. If it gets too cold, it's going to turn on the heat. If it gets too warm, it'll turn on the air conditioning. In this picture here, we have an example of thyroid hormones. So T3 and T4 are the body's thyroid hormones. If they are too low, it's going to send a message triggering the hypothalamus to produce TRH and the anterior pituitary to produce TSH and stimulate the thyroid to produce more. If they're too high, it's going to send a message to the anterior pituitary saying you need to shut this down. Send less TSH so that the thyroid will make less of the hormone. So negative feedback loops are by far the most common. It's attempting to reverse a change in the body so that it can keep things consistent. Occasionally we do run into positive feedback loops. These are going to reinforce changes occurring in the body. So we only have a couple of examples with these. The first one would be during the labor and delivery process. If we don't intensify the uterine contractions, the fetus is never going to come out and you're not going to have the baby. The other one is in blood clotting. If you spring a leak in the system, you need to have the blood thickened to form a clot. If that doesn't happen, the body will continue to lose blood. In anatomy and physiology, it's important you become comfortable with the anatomical terms. I would recommend starting to use them as part of your everyday language. You want them to be able to be used just like you describe something as being up or down, right or left. You want these terms to be readily available for you to describe things. So to start out with, we have to determine what is our frame of reference or the anatomical position. So this position is going to be with the person facing forward and the palms are up, toes are pointed down, or the person is standing in that position. So 
So when we're talking about things being up and down, we would use the term superior or inferior. There are other older terms like cranial or cephalic that are still in use. Superior is going to mean towards the head or the top of the body. Inferior or caudal means towards the tail or the bottom of the body. You can use them to describe where things are relative to each other. You can say that the forehead is superior to the nose. Anterior and posterior or dorsal and ventral are going to refer to front and back surfaces. So the posterior is on the back side, anterior is on the front side. Medial and lateral are going to refer to where things are towards the midline or the sides of the body. Medial would be towards the midline. You could say that your sternum is medial to the shoulders. Laterals towards the sides. Your ears would be lateral to your nose. Distal and proximal, we use these for the arms and legs. Because the arms and legs can move in different positions, it could be confusing and contradictory to use the other terms to describe things on the arms and legs. So distal is going to be further away from the center of the body or the core. You could say that the hand is distal to the elbow. Proximal will be closer to the center or the core of the body. You could say that the shoulder is proximal to the elbow. Superficial is going to be towards the surface. Your skin would be superficial. The muscles would be deep to the skin below the surface towards the center or inside of the body. When we're talking about positions the body is in, prone would be lying front down or face down. Supine would be lying face up or back down. Sometimes they get referred to as face up and down when technically when you're looking at a living body, most of the time the person is not going to lay with their face completely flat down and being smashed. We still refer to it as the prone position if their face is turned to the side for comfort and breathing. The planes are different slices of the body that would allow you to view different sections. The sagittal is going to divide the body into right and left parts. We refer to this as mid-sagittal if it happens directly in the middle and cuts it into equal right and left halves. The frontal or coronal is going to cut the body into front and back parts. And then the transverse or horizontal is going to cut the body into top and bottom parts. So we can see these in these pictures here that it cuts in the X, Y, and Z axis. This is important so that if you're looking at an image, you know what frame of reference the person is looking at something from. It just helps with clear communication. And when you're working in healthcare, it's really important that if you're describing a part of the body that has an issue, that everybody involved in those decisions is aware of what body part we're actually talking about. So inside, the body has different cavities that we can divide these up into dorsal and ventral cavities. The dorsal cavity is going to contain the brain and the spinal cord. This may seem a little bit weird that the brain is in a dorsal cavity, but it has to do with embryological development. The posterior tissues folded over on themselves to form the brain, so they're contained in the same set of membranes or cavities. So the cranial portion contains the brain, and the vertebral portion contains the spinal cord. For the ventral cavities, we can divide these up into the thoracic and abdominal pelvic. With the thoracic, this is going to contain the heart and lungs. It's the structures within the rib cage. The abdominal pelvic, the abdominal area is above the pelvic bowl. This is going to have a lot of your gastrointestinal organs in it. The pelvic is within the bowl of the pelvis. It's going to have gastrointestinal structures as well as some of the reproductive organs. The mediastinum is a specialized space that's between the lungs. This is where the heart and the blood vessels are going to sit. So when we look at the abdominal pelvic regions, so the spacing on this is a little bit off on the document that I'm using to open this. Um, the spacing is more normal in the notes that you'll actually print out. So in the abdominal pelvic area, we can divide this up into different regions so that if you find a mass or a lesion on somebody, 
and it's on the abdominal pelvic area, this helps you be able to narrow down where exactly you found it. So across the top, you're going to have the right and left hypochondriac and the epigastric in the middle. In the midsection, you're going to have the right and left lumbar and then the umbilical in the middle. And then on the lower end, you have the right and left iliac and the hypogastric in the center. So that system works fine, but sometimes you're going to have something you find be on one of the lines. So we also have another system of quadrants that's going to divide up the abdomen into four regions, a right and left upper quadrant and a right and left lower quadrant. An important thing to keep in mind when you're describing things on a body, you're describing it on the patient's body or the cadaver or the human that you are talking about. You're not describing it as the observer's frame of reference. You're talking about right and left on the person's body. Retroperitoneal is going to be behind the peritoneal membrane. So if you imagine an animal carcass being opened up and you remove all of the organs out of it, there is the shiny membrane that's lining that cavity. That's going to be your peritoneal membrane. The kidneys are located behind that. So they're in a separate category from most of those other organs. So here we're going to look at some basic chemistry to review. So your elements are the smallest unit of individual chemical makeup. Well, we can divide up the different elements into their subatomic particles. They're no longer going to keep the properties that went with that element. An atom is a single unit of one element. In the center, you're going to have the nucleus. It's going to have your protons that have a positive charge and your neutrons with a neutral charge. Around the outside, you have the orbitals or shells that are going to have the electrons that have negative charges. When we refer to molecules, a molecule is going to have more than one atom of the same element, where a compound is going to have more than one atom, and they're going to be different elements. This is a little bit of a technicality that is not held to very strictly. We talk about water molecules all the time, but technically water is a compound because it's two hydrogens and one oxygen. When you look on the periodic table, along with seeing the different symbols, there will be some numbers in there. So one of the numbers is generally the atomic number. It's going to tell you how many protons are in the nucleus. Another number you commonly see on there is the atomic mass that will tell you the weight or the mass of an atom. And it's going to be an atomic mass unit or Daltons. We use this other unit because they are so small that to use grams or milligrams makes awkward numbers to work with. So there are a few atoms we see real commonly in the body. This is just to kind of give you some idea so you know the abbreviations that I will commonly use in the notes. You don't have to sit down to memorize all the chemical symbols, but the ones we run into most commonly, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, and iron. Free radicals are another important thing we see they are going to have an unpaired electron, which makes them very reactive and destructive. These are neutralized by antioxidants. So vitamin A, C, E, and selenium are the most common, but there are many others. With antioxidants, it's important that we have a variety of them because different antioxidants will work on different free radicals. So free radicals can cause a lot of damage within the body, but they do also seem to be somewhat essential to trigger some of the processes to go on in the body. So when we look at chemical bonds, we're going to have to go up and down a little bit here so we can see this full picture. The ionic bonds are created by the attraction of positive and negative charges. <clears throat> so when we look at different atoms, they have these different electron shells around them. The first one likes to have two electrons. The next one likes to have eight. The one after that likes to have eight. We generally don't use this model for things bigger than this. 
So here with sodium, it's only got one electron in this outermost shell. It's not even close to having eight. So it's gonna be very aggressive at getting rid of that outermost electron so that it can have a full shell on the outside. When it does this, it's going to have a positive charge because it's gotten rid of one of the electrons but not one of the protons. Chlorine here has seven in its outermost shell. It's going to very aggressively seek out getting one more electron to fill that shell. So when sodium lets it go, the chlorine's happy to take it and become the chloride ion. It will have a negative charge because it's going to have more electrons than protons. What's going to hold these two things together is the attraction of positive and negative charges. So these are a fairly strong bond as long as they stay dry. They will tend to come apart in water because instead of having to rely on that other positive or negative charge, they'll actually bond to the partial positive and negative charges of the water molecules. So covalent bonds are gonna involve sharing electrons. So here in this little picture here, we have a hydrogen that's got one electron here. It would like to have two. What's going to happen is these are going to get close enough to each other that they're able to have their electrons pass through each other's shell. So it will be shared. And that will make those a very strong bond as well. So there are other larger molecules that can do that as well. Hydrogen bonds, these are going to be the attraction of partial positive and negative charges. This is going to happen when we have sharing of electrons, but things aren't shared equally. This is very common in water. The oxygen is going to have a stronger pull on its electrons than the hydrogens do that it's sharing it with. That's going to mean the electrons are going to hang out in one area more than the other, leaving a partial positive and partial negative charge that can be attracted to each other. When we look at chemical reactions, chemical energy is important. This is the energy that's stored in the chemical, the molecule, or the compounds. Synthesis reactions are going to be ones where we build things. These are generally going to require that energy is put into the system. Decomposition reactions are going to be ones where we break things down. These are generally going to release energy. Chemistry can be broken down into two main categories, organic and inorganic. Organic compounds are going to have carbon as the central molecule. Sometimes it's referred to as the chemistry of hydrocarbons because hydrogen is frequently going to be bound to those carbons. With inorganic compounds, carbon is not the central molecule. Sometimes carbon is involved, but a lot of times it's not. It's only involved in a few cases of really small things like carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. When we look at living things, water is extremely important. It's going to be a medium for the reactions to take place in. It's also going to participate in the reactions. If you look at baking, for example, sometimes you'll have dry ingredients that you'll mix together, and when you put water in there, it actually allows them to physically combine. It creates a medium for those reactions to take place. Water absorbs and releases heat slowly. This is important for us to be able to live at a variety of temperatures. It helps make our temperature more stable. It's gonna re require a large amount of heat in order to form a gas. So if you look at really large bodies of water like the Puget Sound, even though it will warm up a little bit over the summer, we don't have enough heat to significantly warm that body of water. It's never gonna become a tropical ocean. Water also will act as a lubricant in the body. So when we have things dissolved, we've got a few terms here we need to look at. A solvent is gonna be a substance in which a molecule dissociates or breaks apart. Water is a common solvent. The solute is gonna be the substance which is gonna separate in the solvent 
For example, if you take table salt or sodium chloride, it's going to separate in the solvent. The solution would be the solute dissolved or separated in there. If we take our example of sodium chloride again, that would be the salt water. pH is important when we talk about water. This is your percent hydrogen or potential hydrogen. Sometimes the water molecule is going to come apart. And when it does, it cannot be split in half equally. What you're going to have is the hydroxide ion separate and the hydrogen ion separate. When you have an acid, it means you have free hydrogen ion. In bases, the hydrogen ion is bound up or you have more free hydroxides. There is some variation where chemistry does have more than one definition of an acid and base. Here in anatomy and physiology, we're trying to just keep it really simple. Acids have more free hydrogen ion, base has more free hydroxide ions. Buffers are important in the body because they're gonna to help to absorb the pH change. It's going to keep the pH from changing as easily as it might without a buffer. This is important because pH changes a lot of times are going to turn things on and off. If you go up a few flights of stairs, you're going to have a pH change in your bloodstream that is going to trigger your brain to tell you to start to breathe faster. You don't want to have that pH change occurring so easily. You wouldn't want to be breathing hard from picking up a pen or a pencil like you are from going up and down a few flights of stairs. So looking at some of our bigger molecules here, first one are the carbohydrates. There's an example of a glucose molecule here. These are used for energy. So a simple carbohydrate is one that's broken down more easily, where complex carbohydrates are more difficult for the body to break down. Saccharide is a term that means the carbohydrate. So a monosaccharide just has one sugar molecule. Disaccharides have two. Polysaccharides have many. In general, polysaccharides are going to be more complex and more challenging for the cells to break down. Lipids or fats, these are used for energy storage. They are used for insulation and they can also be used to make hormones. When we look at fats, one of the things we're looking at is their level of saturation. How many hydrogens are attached to it? So here in this top fatty acid chain, it's saturated. Each of these carbons is attached to the maximum number of hydrogens. There are no carbons with carbon-carbon double bonds. Down below here where you have one that is unsaturated, you have this double bond here. What this does is puts a little kink in the molecule. It changes the shape. These that are nice and straight lines are able to be stacked up nice and easily, and it makes them very stable. They're going to be more likely to be solid at room temperature. So your saturated fats would be things like butter and lard. When you have this unsaturated point in here, they're less stable. Those would be things that are more likely to be liquid at room temperature, things like olive oil. So if it's monounsaturated, there is one carbon that's not fully saturated with hydrogen. Polyunsaturated is going to have more than one of them. Another important type of lipid we have are the phospholipids. These are going to have this phosphate head on them that's going to be polar. It's going to like water. Below, you have the two fatty acid tails attached. They're nonpolar. They do not like water. Having these different properties is going to make these a good candidate to make your cell membranes. We will go into those more a little bit later on. The sterols are fats that are in ring shapes. So in animal cells, the most common one is cholesterol, but there are other sterols in plants. Here's an example of what cholesterol looks like. So there are four ring shapes in there. We use these to make a lot of hormones. So they are called steroid hormones because of being derived from the sterols. These would be things like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and cortisol. So proteins, these are what 
the body likes to use to make structures. They're made up of amino acids, which are the building blocks of the proteins. There's 20 different kinds of amino acids in the body. They're all going to have a carbon in the center. They're all going to have this hydroxyl group, or I'm sorry, the carboxyl group on one side. They'll have an amine group on one side, a hydrogen on one side. And the only thing that's different on all 20 of the amino acids is what is put in the place of R. So peptides are going to be your amino acids in a protein. If you have a polypeptide, it's multiple amino acids. A protein is generally going to be multiple polypeptides. One of the things we use this for is to make enzymes, which can help control reactions. Another place that we're going to see these is deoxyribonucleic acids. It's a protein that's the genetic blueprint for making every structure in the body. So here is an example illustration of one. What you can see is you've got this sugar phosphate backbone here, and then what's going to make up these base pairs in the center are going to be the nucleotide base pairs C, G, A, and T, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. So it takes on a kind of a twisted ladder type of shape. So we say that it is a double helix because you have that sugar phosphate backbone with those base pairs in the center that's twisted. So your base pairs are the pairs of peptides that make up the rungs of the ladder. Adenine and thymine are always paired together in DNA. Cytosine and guanine are always paired together in both DNA and RNA. In RNA, it's a little bit different. It's going to use uracil in place of thymine. It's going to be a very similar structure that will fit in there. So RNA is ribonucleic acid, DNA deoxyribonucleic acid. One more important molecule here is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is a high energy molecule that's used as an energy currency. So when we break things down in the body, we want to be able to store the energy, and we're going to store the energy in the bonds of ATP. When you need to fuel things happening in your body, you're going to spend some of that ATP. You're going to break those bonds as a way to provide that energy. <clears throat> so now we'll start looking at the cell, finally looking at something that is alive. The cell is going to be surrounded by the plasma membrane. The cytoplasm is all of the contents inside of the cell. In general, the cytoplasm does not include the nucleus. That is exempt. Inside the cell, you're going to have little specialized structures we refer to as organelles. They're going to be in a fluid portion of the cell called the cytocell. So the cytoplasm is all of the contents inside its cytosol and organelles. The cytosol is just that liquid portion. And then the nucleus is going to contain the genetic information. So the plasma membrane around the outside is a phospholipid bilayer. So bilayer means two layers. It's phospholipid. Inside of it is hydrophobic, and then outside is hydrophilic. This means you can have watery surface inside the cell and watery surface outside the cell, but it keeps them from wanting to cross through that middle area where it's hydrophobic. This is important because it gives the membrane selective permeability. It will allow some things to pass while others cannot. In addition, the cell membrane is going to be important for identification. The cell will have markers on there that will identify what kind of cell it is, what species it belongs to, even what individual it belongs to. This allows them to communicate with other cells. So when things go to cross the membrane, this can happen a few different ways. With passive diffusion, things are able to cross through the membrane. It can cross anywhere and no energy is required. So passive tells you that no energy is required. 
Diffusion means it's going to move from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. It wants to be able to spread out. With passive transport, again, it's a passive process. No energy is required. But transport's telling you that it needs to happen at a specific location. There's generally going to be a protein that's going to be a site where things are able to cross. With active transport, energy is going to be required. It has to cross at a specific location, and the cell is going to have to expend energy for this to happen. Generally, this is going to be moving across a concentration gradient, and that's why it's going to have to expend the energy in order to do that. When we talk about the concentration of something, we're looking at how much of that substance is in a particular volume of fluid or space. The more concentrated, the more of the substance you have. For example, if you had two equal-sized glasses of water, in one of them you put a spoonful of sugar, in the other one you put a cup of sugar, the one with a cup of sugar is going to be more concentrated. Osmotic pressure is the pressure of water. Water is going to want to be equal on both sides of the membrane. Sometimes you can't have the substance move. It's too large to cross the membrane, so the water will move to try and dilute the substance. Terms we use for these are hyper and hypotonic. Hypertonic means you have an area with a higher concentrate. Hypotonic is an area with lower concentration. And if something is isotonic, it's the same concentration on both sides of the membrane. So occasionally when this process goes wrong, you have a cell that will undergo crenation. It becomes dehydrated or dried out. Likewise, if a cell is put in pure water, you're going to have water rush in and it will burst. So sometimes the cell needs to have things go in and out that are too big to cross the membrane. So it will take it in by other means. Endocytosis is the term we use for the cell taking something in. Phagocytosis means cell eating. This is implying that the cell is taking in a solid particle. The membrane will wrap around and engulf that particle. Penocytosis means cell drinking. This is implying that what's being taken in is a liquid droplet. With exocytosis, it's the reverse. The cell is going to remove or excrete something through the cell. It will push it out through the membrane. So when things are being pushed through the membrane, it will often form vesicles where the membrane will wrap around the substance. That can happen inside the cell where it will wrap a membrane around something that it's produced. It can do this as a way of isolating it from the rest of the cell so that it doesn't cause damage. The cytosol, this is that liquid portion of the cell. It's the same stuff as the interstitial fluid. It's mostly water, 75 to 90 percent. It will also contain some solids, things like glucose, various amino acids, lipids, ATP, and waste products. The cell has a cytoskeleton. This is going to provide support, structure, and roadways in the cell. And it will have different size fibers that make it up. The microfilaments are going to be the smallest. They help contribute to the shape and strength of the cell, provide support, movement, and help form the microvilli. The microvilli will be little finger-like projections on the cell. The intermediate filaments are a little bit larger. They help to hold the organelles in place. You're going to find these in areas with a lot of tension and stretching. If you're going to do phagocytosis of something and you're going to stretch out part of the cell, you're going to need to have some reinforcement fibers in there so you don't just lob off part of the cell. The microtubules are the largest of the fibers. They're also going to contribute to cell shape and movement of the organelles. They'll help in forming cilia and flagella and also in moving secretory vesicles. The centrosome is a little structure that's going to make the centrioles. This is not a well understood structure, but we do see it used in cell division and it's going to help in stretching these fibers across the cell to pull the cell apart. 
So cilia are multiple little hair-like structures on the cell that are going to be used for movement. This would be more of a crawling movement. They're going to work more like oars with a power and recovery stroke. If the cell is anchored, they can also move mucus across a cell, such as in our trachea. The cells aren't going up and down, but they will pull mucus across the cells. The flagella is a whip-like tail. That's going to propel the cell. Common example in a human cell for this is sperm with their swimming-like motion. Our ribosomes are going to be the organelle involved with protein synthesis. We're going to go more into that process a little bit later on. The endoplasmic reticulum is a membrane network inside the cell. It's very extensive. Some of it is considered rough ER or endoplasmic reticulum because it's going to have ribosomes on the surface giving it a rougher appearance. This will be involved with making secretory proteins and membranes. A lot of times these secretions can travel through the endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth ER does not have ribosomes on the surface. This is more involved with your fatty acid and steroid secretions. The Golgi apparatus, this is used for packaging and modification of secretions. You have the individual cisternae or the pancake layers of the Golgi. So things will come in one side of the Golgi and they will exit out the other side being packaged and modified. Lysosomes. Lyse is something that's going to cause a cell to burst. Some or soma means cell body, so these are enzymes to lyse cells. Sometimes the cell will do autolysis with this, and this may seem like an initially contradictory thing for a cell to do. Why would it want to kill itself? There are times when it's important for cells to kill themselves and be able to recycle the material. So failure of this to happen can actually be behind autoimmune diseases if this doesn't happen with some of your immune cells or when cells should be degraded and they aren't, it can potentially lead to some cancers. Peroxisomes, these are going to contain hydrogen peroxide. So your mitochondria, these are the powerhouse of the cell. This is where energy production is going to occur. The more of these you have, the more energy your cell can produce. So the nucleus is surrounded by the nuclear envelope or membrane. Inside, there's a little dense area of the nucleoli, nucleolus if it's singular. These are going to assemble the ribosomes. When we look at the genetic information, there are several different terms for genetic information. A gene is going to be the portion of the genetic information that's going to code for a particular protein. In humans, only about 1.5% of our DNA is genes. The chromosomes, these are the organized form of the genetic material that we form in cell division. These are the things that look like the little X's that you would stereotypically think of as being your chromosomes. The genome is a generic term for genetic information in the cell. It's not specifically stating what form it's in. Chromatin, this is the loosely coiled DNA. This is the form it's in most of the time. By being loosely coiled, it means that the enzymes can access the DNA to be able to create proteins. Chromatids, these are the individual legs of a chromosome. Sometimes we talk about the sister chromatids that are going to pull apart in cell division to go into the two daughter cells. <coughs> So this is just some terminology with protein synthesis. There are other videos of protein synthesis that will be in your online classroom that will go through and show this process being animated that I would strongly encourage you to watch that will help this process make a lot more sense than just looking at the terms. Your codon or base triplet are the three base pairs that are going to code for a specific amino acid. So in your cell, in your nucleus, you're going to have your DNA that's going to undergo transcription. Transcription is the process of using that DNA as a template to make an RNA in the nucleus. We want to make this RNA because that DNA is very valuable. We want to keep it safe. If you make an RNA, it's like sending a working copy out to the cytoplasm for the workers to read. The workers are going to read it doing translation. 
these are going to be the ribosomes. They're going to use that to make a protein. When they do, it's going to be read in base pairs of three that are your codons. So this table here, this codon table, is what allows you to be able to read this. Your first base pair is going to be here on the left side. So if you start with AUG, you find an A. Across the top is the second base, so that would be U. When you bring these two together, it brings you down to this box. You can find the third base over here on the right, or there is only four to choose from here. We'll tell you AUG is going to code for methionine. So we use that example, and it's in red here, because when you're reading the genetic code, we always start reading at the first AUG. So next example would be if you had CCG. First one is C, second one is C. You bring them both down, it brings you to this box. Here you've got CCG, that's going to code for proline. That would be the second amino acid in the order of the protein. If you had CGA, come C here, G here, A over here, that would code for arginine. So we would go along reading these in sets of three until we come to a stop codon. There are three of them that code for stop, UAA, UAG, and UGA. I like to think of it like when you read a sentence, you always start at the first capital letter. That's your AUG. You know you've gotten to the end of the sentence when you get a punctuation mark, period, question mark, or exclamation mark. That's what these are like here for reading that. So that mRNA, this is that messenger RNA or the working copy. This is so that master copy of instructions, your DNA, stays safe in the nucleus. When the ribosomes are going along and reading those codons, you're going to use a tRNA, a transfer RNA. This will be attached to the amino acid, and you can use this to match up with the codon and make sure you're bringing the right amino acid for that step. The ribosomes also have rRNA in there, ribosomal RNA. It's part of their structure. They're able to translate this genetic code. When you get ready to read a gene, you have all these different genes in your cell, but we need to be able to regulate which ones are read at any given time. If every cell has the potential to make every single structure in the body, that would be like saying to your fingers, go ahead and produce saliva. Nobody wants that happening. So we need to have ways of regulating this. One of the regulatory things is a promoter. It's a sequence that will enhance protein synthesis and control which genes are turned on and off. Terminators are nonsense sequence. They're going to terminate protein synthesis. Your anticodon, this is the mirror image to the codon. This is going to be on the tRNA. This will allow it to match up so that you have complementary nucleotides in there to make sure it's bringing the correct amino acid. So again with this, I do strongly recommend that you watch the little video animations on this process. It will make a lot more sense watching those. So last little bit to cover on this section, somatic cell division. Your somatic cells are your non-sex cells. This is going to be everything except the sperm and the egg. These cells spend most of their life in interphase. This is when they're doing their normal job, their normal role as that cell. When they get to the mitotic phase, this is the dividing part of their life cycle. It's usually 10% or less. And this will get divided into four phases. So the first phase is prophase. Here, that chromatin that's loosely coiled is going to form the chromosomes. You're going to start to form the mitotic spindle, and the nucleolus is going to disappear. The second phase is metaphase. Here, the chromosomes are going to align along the center of the cell. We call it the metaphase plate. Your nuclear envelope disappears, and the mitotic spindle elongates. It's very important that you have all of these chromosomes aligned along the middle so they can divide evenly among the two daughter cells. 
During anaphase, the sister chromatids are going to separate. This will split the genetic information into the two cells. You'll have cytokinesis where you start to divide the cytoplasm and form a cleavage furrow to start to pinch the two cells off. In telophase, these cells are going to go back to having the chromatids be chromatin. You're going to form a new nucleolus, the mitotic spindle disappears, and you'll have a new nuclear membrane. So this picture here is nice for observing it. For what we use for our textbook, prophase and pre-prometaphase are combined together. So here you have formed the chromosomes, nuclear envelope starting to break down. Here in metaphase, you've got this metaphase plate where the chromosomes are aligned. In anaphase, these are separating. Here you can actually see the cleavage furrow. So between these two phases is when you're going to have cytokinesis. You divide up the cytoplasm and everything in it. And then telophase, when you have your two new cells form, you're going to make new chromosomes. And those two daughter cells will go on to live their individual lives. Meiosis is sex cell division. We'll cover this a little bit later on. But here you're going to do a second division of the cells without replicating the DNA. Mitosis is division of the nucleus. Meiosis is going to reduce the number of the chromosomes. We do this with the sex cells because your sex cell would combine with somebody else's sex cell and fuse together to make the zygote. And that would be how you would restore that normal number of chromosomes. So that's going to be the end of this first lecture.